Okay, well, welcome everyone to this uh, first event of the Bayan Berkeley Partnership. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Asad Ahmad. I am professor of Arabic and Islamic studies and the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, both at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'm um, privileged, honored, and proud to kick off this uh, partnership. Uh, the, the plan here is that I'll make some brief comments about the nature of this uh, partnership. Which, which is in its nascent phase right now. Um, I will uh, then uh, introduce uh, the speakers, tell you a little bit about how the program will run, and then hand it over to my colleague, uh, Jaat Tork. Uh, so the uh, Bayan Berkeley partnership, which uh, is uh, the aim here is to have a kind of a hybrid collaboration and exploration of some of the most pressing questions pertaining to Islam and Muslims. Um, in my own research and training over the years uh, in the field of Islamic studies, uh, I have been trained in Western academia, and there are certain methodologies that are specific to secular institutions, certain frameworks that, uh, that we teach our students and that we employ for, a, a, uh, for writing history, for writing narratives, for exploring religion, and so on. Um, there are, of course, other frameworks of inquiry, too. Those, for example, that approach the subject matter from an internal perspective, uh, those that approach it from a hybrid perspective and so on. Uh, my aim and the aim of uh, the partners at Bayan, including the president Jihad Turk, whom you'll meet very shortly, is to find a space of collaboration, a middle space where the pluralistic frameworks of inquiry can be explored in discussing Islam and other religions. Uh, the aim is not to modify or transform the frameworks. I do personally think that the different frameworks of inquiry are the most effective um, when they are brought in conversation with each other, where differences uh, in the broader frames are highlighted so that we may understand the kinds of conclusions we reach uh, with a full consciousness and clarity and transparency in the frames of inquiry that we use. This is, of course, a result of uh, decades of work that has been done in literary theory, in critical theory, in narratology, in historiography, and so on. So this is the first event in this uh, budding relationship between Bayan on the one hand, and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Berkeley. This is a, a hybrid space where we're going to explore different issues from a historical, academic um, perspective on Islam, and also involving the voices of those traditions and individuals who are within, uh, operating from within the traditions and in, uh, using and deploying internal frameworks of inquiry. So uh, with that brief set of comments, I am going now to tell you how this program is going to run. Um, uh, after introducing our speakers and the moderator, uh, we are going to hear from our two speakers, Dr. Asifa Qureshi and uh, Mrs. Majida Abdul Karim. Uh, following that, uh, the president of Bayan, uh, Jihad Turk, is going to have a brief conversation with them. Uh, along the way, as you hear the presentations, please feel free to type your questions and comments in the chat window. We will collect them. And then after conversations with uh, the two speakers, President Jihad Turk is going to field you, send your questions forward to the speakers. We do have limited time, uh, so I can't promise we'll reach all the questions and comments, but we'll do uh, justice to them as much as we can. So at this point, let me introduce our uh, moderator first and then uh, our two distinguished speakers. Uh, Jihad Turk is the founding president and dean of Bayan Islamic Graduate School, a preeminent Muslim institution of higher education, offering accredited master's degrees in the fields of Islamic studies, leadership, and chaplaincy. He completed his BA degree in history and Arabic at the University of California, Berkeley, an MA degree at the University of Texas, Austin, in Arabic and Islamic law and jurisprudence, and pursued doctoral studies in Islamic law at the University of California, Los Angeles. Currently, Jihad is doing a doctorate in education at the University of Southern California. President Turk has served as both an academic as well as a religious leader. He has taught at UCLA and Southern, the Southwestern School of Law and has served as the Imam and Director of Religious Affairs at the Islamic Center of Southern California LA's oldest and largest mosque. He's a sought after national speaker and media commentator on Muslims in America, reform movements, ethical leadership, and the spiritual formation of Muslim youth. He's a prominent interfaith leader 
and co-founder of the Muslim Christian Consultative Group, as well as the Greater Los Angeles Muslim Jewish Forum. He has often been consulted by the White House and has traveled abroad for the US State Department. Recently, Professor uh, Dr. Turk uh, was recognized as one of the 500 most influential people in Los Angeles by the LA Business Journal. Our first speaker today is Dr. Asifa Qureshi Landis. Um, Asifa Qureshi Landis is professor of law at the University of Wisconsin Madison, where she specializes in comparative Islamic and US constitutional law, with a current focus on modern Islamic constitutional theory. She is a 2009 Carnegie Scholar and a 2012 Guggenheim Fellow. She has served as a public delegate on the United States delegation to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, the Task Force on Religion and the Making of US Foreign Policy for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and as advisor to the Pew Task Force on Religion and Public Life. Her four forthcoming publications include Healing a Wounded Islamic Constitutionalism, Sharia, Legal Pluralism, and Unlearning the Nation State Paradigm, and legislating morality and other illusions about Islamic government. Currently, she is working on a book manuscript called Islamic Reconstitutionalism, in which she proposes a new model of Islamic constitutionalism for today's Muslim majority countries. Professor Qureshi Landis holds a doctorate from Harvard Law School and other degrees from Columbia Law School, the University of California, Davis, and the University of California, Berkeley. Our second speaker today is Mrs. Majida Abdul Karim. For the past 29 years, Mrs. Abdul Karim has dedicated her professional career to the empowerment and education of children and families. Mrs. Abdul Karim has been recognized for her outstanding leadership of one of the top performing schools in the country and one of the top 50 high schools in New York City. For almost a decade, she served as a school administrator and senior leader for the Abu Dhabi Department of Education and Knowledge Department in the UAE. Her international engagement experience also includes presenting and working with the NGO, the World Conference for Religions and Peace, the African National Conference under the late President Nelson Mandela, and the Africa Project. She has been recognized in the New York Daily News, New York Post, and US News and World Report, as well as by the Broad Foundation and Gates Foundation for her ability to enhance student achievement amongst urban youth in underserved communities. Mrs. Abdul Karim currently serves as a consultative board member for Muhammad Schools of Atlanta. She's a board member and special advisory council for Darun Noor Academy and sits on the executive board for the Georgia Muslim Voters Project. Mrs. Abdul Karim earned her BA from the City College of New York in history and secondary education, her MA in social studies education from New York University and MS in education in education administration from Baruch College. In these three colleagues, I present to you some of the best socially engaged, religiously sensitive, polit politically pluralistic and academically robust discourse on the pressing topic we will be discussing today, namely democracy, Muslim civic engagement and the Sharia. So with that now I pass the the event to my colleague, Professor uh, uh, um, uh, President Jihad Turk. Uh, Jihad, please take it away. Thank you so much, Assad, um, and welcome to everybody today. Uh, Assad did most of my work for me. Uh, I'll just reiterate, um, our speakers will each present for about 20 to 25 minutes each, and uh, we'll engage with them afterwards with questions. Um, you are able to uh, send me your questions in the meantime as they occur to you and uh, after their presentations as well. I will be collating those questions and presenting them as best as I'm able to in the short time that we're together today. Uh, so with no further ado and with the wonderful um, introductions that, uh, that Dr. Asad Ahmed made, I now present to you uh, Asfa Qureshi. I am the, uh, the timekeeper as part of my charge as uh, moderator today, so uh, you might hear from me if uh, you start to go a little bit over your, your, your time allocation there, uh, Dr. Horaishi Landa. So make sure you oh unmute gosh. yourself. Okay, Great. I just unmuted myself. All right, um, 
Assalamu alaikum, uh, peace be with everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am going to try to do this new creative thing that I have come up with to share my screen and have my visuals next to my face instead of you seeing my visuals as the only thing because I think that you might get a little distracted with some stuff that's not supposed to be there the whole time. So I'm gonna try this. Um, let's see if it works. I'm sharing my screen for a second here and Jihad didn't like this. He said that the it was a little distracting, but we're gonna try it. Um, if he says it's too distracting, you'll you'll let me know. So um, here we go. All right. So um, this is a familiar picture. We've been very happy to see this more often now. This is uh, Keith Ellison, uh, our first Muslim elected to Congress, swearing on the Quran as he was sworn in. And the to the right is is a few years later when uh, Ilham Omar was elected to the state legislature in Minnesota. She's now, as you know, in, in Congress. But I picked these as examples of the idea of Muslims. So there it is. It Did it? Did my picture disappear? No, it's oh, here. Man, it's okay? Yep. Okay, all right, good. Um, Jihad's nodding like, I knew it, I knew it. If, if you force me into the little corner picture, just let me know, Jihad. Um, all right, so the thing about this is that they're swearing on a Quran, right? So. I'm starting there. What does that mean that a Muslim is swearing on the Quran as part of their role in an American civic job? Um, is the Quran supposed to influence them in any way? I mean, they are Muslims. Islamophobes are worried that that is a symbol of Muslims bringing Sharia into their job, right? So doesn't the Quran mean Sharia? Isn't that something that um, we're afraid of as American? The secular community is afraid that you're going to bring Sharia, as it's stereotypically known in the media, into uh, American rule of law and threaten American rule of law in that way. And this is an example of a, a poll done, uh, that Pew poll that he mentioned that I was an advisor to, um, poll of, of Muslims around the world saying, yeah, I, I favor bringing in Sharia as the official law of the land. So you get worries that Sharia actually threatens the American rule of law and actually states banning Sharia implementation in, in our state courts and elsewhere. And so there is this question of what does it mean for an American Muslim civic servant, civil servant, public servant to swear on the Quran? Most Muslims in that position say, of course not. I'm not going to bring any of that stuff in to the the uh, Amer to American to my role in my job here in America because it is our responsibility to follow the law of the land where we live, and that is true. Um, it is the oh the tiny little words there, but if you if you freeze your screen, you might be able to read it later. This is just an excerpt from a, a from, from a law review article, but the point of this quote is coming out of classical. Um, Islamic legal doctrine saying Muslims are obligated to follow the law of the land where they live. And, and they're not allowed by fiqh, by the scholars of Islamic law to do anything that would be hostile to or threaten the safety or, or rule of law of the land that they live in. And so that's usually what people reference if they know something about Sharia and the role of American Muslims living in a non-Muslim land. You say, it's my job to follow the law of the land where I live. But there's a little wrinkle here that people don't tend to identify directly. And that is that in a democracy, the law of the land is something that we have a voice in. So it complicates that standard answer, like, oh, I follow the law of the land where I am, because the next question is, yeah, but if you can change the law of the land where you are, then what are you gonna do with that? So it just brings us back around to the same question of what is the obligation of American Muslims in these jobs where it's not just elected officials like Ilhan Omar and Keith Ellison, this goes all the way down to local officials, PT, PTA, your role as a PTA member, if you're involved in your school board, um, even as a voter, even as I walk into that voting booth, which I hope you've all done and or will do tomorrow, I am impacting how the law of the land is going to operate in, the, in this country. And so the question comes back around, what is our obligation? So, so far I've seen two answers as Muslims respond and work with, through this question. The first one is that we're wearing basically two hats. We are not going to bring any of our Sharia selves into our role because I keep my private Muslim Sharia self to myself. And all of that is something different than my secular role in my secular job. And so don't worry about me bringing Sharia in. I keep all that stuff to myself. I'm going to do my secular job. That's true. And it's OK. And it kind of calms some people down. But, but it doesn't really say very much about Islam as a good thing. It sounds like our Muslimness needs to be kept out of 
what contributes to American society, that there's nothing about my Islam and my values as a Muslim that would actually make America a better place. So it kind of confuses this and acts like we're hiding something. And actually Sharia especially continues to have this negative association that it's something to hide, it's something to keep away from our, my role as serving the public good in, in my job. And it, as again, as an elected official or just as my job as voting as an American citizen. So that's one approach. I keep my private, I wear my public hat and my public life, I keep my Islam to myself. Um, and as I said, I'm not, I'm not all that thrilled with that answer. I think it, it kind of hurts the overall sense of what Muslims are in this country. So the other approach I've seen is to undertake a, an interesting project that's very popular around the world with Muslims in general, and that is law reform. That is, let's look at the rules that people associate with Islam as Islamic law and say, well, is there room for new interpretations of the kinds of rules that we think about? So yes, is there maybe the rules of Islamic law are gender biased in some way, but is there new ijtihad that we could do that would change that? And so we would search for those aspects of Islamic law and new ijtihad, new, new, new interpretations of Islamic legal rules that would then be more compatible with American law, US law in general. That is interesting. And there actually are some really interesting parallels. There's some commonality already. Um, I teach American constitutional law. So I get lots of people asking me, oh, show me what commonalities there are. And I've done a little bit of writing in this field. And there's some really fascinating comparisons like the principle of innocent to proven guilty and even the exclusionary rule that you're not allowed to invade someone's privacy to gather evidence before you can use it to prosecute them for a crime. I think mean, there's some really interesting parallels and it's fascinating comparative law field, but it doesn't really take you all the way. Like if you really look at it, there really are some significant differences between the law that we associate with Islam, the rules of our Sharia behavior and the law on the books in the United States. Marriage law in Islam really is easier for men to access certain rights than for women. And the same is true of child custody and inheritance and a bunch of other things. So if you're really trying to mesh these two together, it's a lot of work. And I think it's unrealistic, right? So is every single judge, every single senator, every single PTA member, every single even American voter supposed to do the hard work to research all the new which she had, all the new legal ideas that are existing in this world of Islamic legal thought, and then come up and find the one that matches up. And then that's the one that I'm doing in my job as an American public servant. Um, and also, even if that were possible, it doesn't necessarily have credibility with the American Muslim, uh, with the Muslim community in general. And then even within the American Muslim community, not everybody is a fan of some of these legal reform ideas. Some, some people don't agree with some of the new age they had, the new legal thinking that's out there. So it, it's not really that effective. So I think there's a better way. And that involves really understanding Sharia at a much more nuanced level. And so I'm going to give you my little Sharia 101 here in, in brief. And that really means broadening our understanding and, and making a little bit more complicated understanding of what Sharia is. So first of all, you have to understand that there is a very different way of thinking about law in a Western context and in a pre-modern, pre-colonial Muslim context. So in a Western context, we tend to think of law as what the state does. So law is what happens at the state level and anything else that governs people's behavior, influences people's behavior, it's not law, it might affect you, but it's morality, it's ethics, it's religious practices and rituals, but it's not law. It's only law if the state does it. And then the law then is centralized with the state. So it's usually relatively uniform and handled by the state. This is actually conceptually very different than law as it existed in pre-modern legal systems in the Muslim world. And that is that there were two types of law there was law that we tend to associate with as Islamic law, which mostly I'm gonna zoom in on the right side in a second, which is things about how to live your life as a Muslim, which are largely extrapolated from scripture and then giving people guidelines on how to live. But that wasn't the only kind of law that existed in Muslim lands. There also was the stuff that the ruler was doing, the things that were done at the level of organizing the society. And I've said here in the little arrow there that the idea of what the authority of the ruler was, was that they were supposed to serve the public good. So the nature of the things, the kinds of laws that the state was doing and the kinds of laws that we associate with the fuqaha is actually quite different. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on, um, I have to move over here, um, on the right-hand side. So that was, so you see those two types? Now I'm gonna zoom in on the purple circle a little bit. So 
This is for anyone who's studied Islamic law or Islamic history in general, probably find this familiar. Sharia itself it, as a word linguistically means path or way. So I like to think of it as the way God wants us to live in the world. And we have information about that from two sources. There's the Quran, which Muslims say is the word of God. And then there's the Sunnah, the example of the last prophet. Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so from those two sources, we have scholars, private legal scholars, not state entities, private individuals doing some extrapolation from those two sources to come up with specific rules on all of the things that aren't specifically answered in those texts, which are quite a lot of things. So you have lots of people looking at that and thinking about, well, here's this new situation that's not exactly addressed. How can we answer this new question? And so what naturally happens is, if you know anything about Islamic law, is the more people doing this work of extrapolation, the more different answers you'll get in the world of fiqh, which is the word that's used to refer to the actual doctrinal rules of how to live your life as a Muslim. So things like, how do I marry? What can I eat? What contracts are legitimate for me to invest in and participate in? And, and how do I dress? And all of the kinds of things that have some, we would categorize in the West as law, things like marriage and divorce and property law and contract law and even criminal law. But it also includes lots of things that are not law in the sense of manners and behavior and prayer and things like that. But it's all in the same books within a Muslim context. These are all law in the sense of Islamic law of how do you act as a Muslim? And the source material for that is those scriptural texts and it's private legal scholars who are doing that work. And it's quite diverse and individual Muslims really have the authority to pick which one of those circles of schools of legal thought that they want to follow. That is happening alongside something that the ruler is doing. So the ruler is also behaving in the world and making rules, but the rules that the ruler is making are very, very different from the kinds of rules that the fiqh scholars are making. And the kinds of rules that the ruler is making are all of those things that are important for the public good, the maslaha amma is the Arabic, that are important for society to function, but are not a matter of scriptural interpretation. So things like monitoring the marketplace for fair weights and measures, and understanding um, what is necessary to build the roads and bridges and keep the economy moving and raising armies to protect uh, the population and setting a minimum price for wheat if there is a problem with the, the supply. Today, we would think about things like traffic rules and zoning and healthcare codes and um, you know re regulations to make sure that uh, environmental uh, environments aren't polluted so that we can breathe. These are all things that are really important for us to live in society, but they're not coming out of scriptural interpretation. You can look at the Quran forever and you're not gonna find the distance between the studs and the walls that needs to be in our houses for our housing code so that they don't fall down. That's something that's important, but it's not scripture. And so these are the two aspects. When I look at these two together, I see together they're operating as a rule of law system. They were separate, but they were interdependent. They operated with an awareness that the other one was there. And they both have roles to make the society function. So if you look at that and you recognize that those are the two types of law that existed in Muslim society, if the responsibility of the ruler from a Sharia perspective, that's the important thing that I wanna say here, there, both of these are serving the overall rule of law from a Sharia perspective, right? And so serving the public good that the ruler is doing is Islamic. But it's Islamic in a very different way than the fiqh rules are Islamic. The fiqh rules are Islamic in a way of how do I live my life as a Muslim in this world? But the ruler's responsibility, their Islamic responsibility is a very different one. Their first responsibility is to serve the public good. So if you start with that and you recognize that that's how overall society functioned in, again, before the colonial, colonial interruption, then the question of what do I do as a Muslim voter or a Muslim public servant actually becomes quite simple. If the, the job of a Muslim ruler is to do the public good, and if in America, the ruler is all of us, then my job when I go into the voting booth, the only question I have on my mind is, what is in the American public good? That's my job. And by the way, that's an Islamic job. It's not not Muslim, it's not a secular outside of Islam kind of thing to do. That's my Islamic job. But it's a very different thing than what is my Islamic behavior in my personal life. They're both within the realm of Sharia, but they're very different aspects of how Sharia operates in the world. So when I ask, what do I think is in the public good? I personally am thinking about things like 
really affordable health care and maybe free college education and better, cleaner water and maybe um, uh, something to do with taxes to equalize the wealth gap and maybe um, better pay for our teachers and all kinds of stuff that are really on my mind when I think about the American public good. Now, are we going to disagree about that? Of course, I'm this liberal lefty went to Berkeley kind of person. And so these are my ideas about what's in the public good. And we can debate in the general American public, but also among American Muslims about what is really in the American public good? What are the kinds of laws that are going to make this country better? But the important thing for me is that in that conversation, we're debating what is actually in the American public good. We're not debating what is the proper interpretation of the Quran for my personal life. That is not a matter for siyasa, the role of the state law. That is a matter for fiqh. And by the way, we have a very diverse attitude about that. And you really mostly can choose which approach you want to follow when we respect those choices. But when it comes to what the state should do, to me, that's a just modern version of siyasa, which is what the word for ruler authority was in the past. And we just have this new phenomenon now that we're collectively part of the ruler because we're in a democracy where we do that. And that's not a counter to Islamic value. That's just a new way of thinking about how do we do the public good? We now just decided based on democratic ideas. The thing is that Muslims have been doing this in the United States already. We already, this is a poll from Pew um, a while ago, 2017, where among many questions it, said, it documents that most American, this is for American Muslims, most American Muslims say that working for justice and protecting the environment are among the ways, are, are things that it means to be a Muslim. So we already in the United States, long before 9-11, we have been involved in the United States in creating all kinds of institutions and doing things for the public good and setting up free healthcare clinics and helping education and organizing charity drives. And Muslims are at the forefront of responding to the water crisis in Flint. We have been doing this for a long time as, role, as our responsibility as Americans, but also we say here, we think of this as our responsibility as a Muslim. And that's wonderful. And I wish more people heard us when we say that. But the thing about that I've noticed is that when we talk about it, we haven't really said, I'm doing this because Sharia tells me to do this. We say, oh, these are my Muslim values. But the word Sharia has become a bad word in our self-narrative. We've let this word be taken over by the Islamophobes who start to speak about it in this negative way. And that's where you get this like, oh, I keep my Sharia to myself. We're okay saying my Islamic values, I think, sometime, but Sharia is the word that we are avoiding. And I feel very sad by that because for me, as I've identified, Sharia, from the perspective of what the state does, what the state's Sharia responsibility is, is actually really wonderful. It's about lifting up the poor and the hungry and giving education to people and making the streets safe and making sure that we have clean air and water to, to, to breathe and drink. These are all things that Sharia asks the ruler to do. These are laws that serve the public good. And yeah, they're a secular thing, but they're also an Islamic thing. And they're not just an Islamic thing, they're a Sharia thing. We should be comfortable saying, yes, it's my Sharia duty as a voter contributing to our democratic ways of making laws for the law of the land, that my role when I sit in that, that moment is to look to see what's in the American public good. And then we shouldn't be scared of the word Sharia when we say that. And I think if we started to do that, and if we're really bold about how we identify what we're doing and change the way we talk about Sharia to say, yeah, there's a Sharia component to the state. Here's what it is. It's serving the public good. Guess what? We've already been doing that. And I'm going to keep doing that because that's my Sharia responsibility as an elected official, as a mayor, as a PTA president, as a school board member, and as just an average voter, that's my job. And so when my mind, if that actually happened and we changed how we think about and talk about Sharia, this, people like this would be the image that people think about when they think about Sharia in the United States. It won't be those horrible images of ISIS and bringing in things that are bad for society and Americans don't understand. No, if American Muslims are known as when we operate in the public sphere, we take the Sharia responsibility, siyasa of the state seriously. And what does that mean? That means serving the public good. And I'm here as an American Muslim to be a part of that conversation with the rest of the American public. So we think about service and justice as our Sharia responsibility as civic voters and citizens. And then that is what we expect when we say, I'm going to the voting booth and I'm voting. And that's also what people expect of us when they see one of us swearing on the Quran if we're ever elected into office. So that's my very quick summary of what I think we could say and do when we're in this 
situation. I'm sure that there's lots of questions. I had to skip through a bunch of details. So um, if you want to tweak and push at the at the nuances of that, I'm happy to get there um, and share ideas with you. But I also really, really want to hear from Sister Majida about all of the things that she's done in some really amazing and very hot button areas over there in Georgia. So I really want to hear what she has to say. All right, thank you so much, Asifa, and wow, on time as well. So uh, you're, you're, that was very, very smooth, and and what a pro. Um, you know, this th your presentation in many ways exemplifies the frame that uh, Dr. Asad Ahmed uh, started out with about how it's enriching to look at uh, different approaches to uh, understanding Islam and Muslims uh, in the world today, and uh, I think both the academic rigor of your research. Uh, but also the insights that you uh, present coming from a Muslim perspective is fascinating. We already have some questions piling up. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, please keep them coming. I'm going to uh, keep note of those as we uh, now transition, transition from the theory uh, presented by Asifa to the on the ground ex lived experience of uh, Muslims or a particular Muslim here. Uh, uh, Ms. Majida, uh, Majida Abdul Karim, who's uh, on the ground and interacting with Muslims as she's trying to get out the vote and register uh, Muslims in the state of Georgia in particular. So uh, with no further ado, um, we ha you have now the floor for the next 20 to 25 minutes. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here today with all of you, specifically with Bayon Claremont and everyone in this community right now. Uh, I want to start out with a quote and focusing on what Dr. Asifa was talking about. You know, in the, in the hadith, it says, whoever of you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. And if he could not, change it with your tongue. And if you cannot, then change it with your heart. But indeed, that is the weakest of faith. Our dean, our religion is one of action, implementation, and justice. So as Dr. Imam Jihad said, I am on the ground running. I am not a political analyst. I am a grassroots worker. I am on the board of the Georgia Muslim Voter Project. And because of this issues of action, right? Not complacency, not being really satisfied with what was going on within the context of the United States and the treatment of Muslim communities, a wonderful, phenomenal powerhouse by the name of Aisha Yaqub started in 2015 the Georgia Muslim Voter Project. And why the Voter Muslim Voter Project? Because she saw that she needed to change something with her hand, not simply her tongue, and not just hate it in her heart. And 2015, the Georgia Muslim Voter Project was birthed. Why was it birthed? To increase civic engagement with the Muslim community and really increase voter registration, right? It was looked at as a part to a whole. That's not the final solution, but if we wanna talk about advocacy and voice, we need to ensure that we have voice by first ensuring that we are registered to vote as one step. After we're registered to vote, we need to make sure we actually go out and we do vote to exercise that civic right as outlined in the 14th Amendment. So what kind of work has the Georgia Muslim Voter Project done? We have registered over 3,000 Muslims in Georgia. We have called over 22,000 people to register and to get out the vote. We've knocked on over a thousand doors. This is pre-corona, mind you, to work on a thousand doors to get people knowledgeable about your rights. What do you do? Know your candidates. And I do want to state that the Georgia Muslim Voter Project is a nonpartisan organization. 
So we don't take sides, but we do know the importance of exercising the voice and getting our voice heard, which led to also what are other Muslim communities doing around the country? There's been a lot of collective work with masajids in over America in the 50 states so that we can galvanize in a lot of partnership work. The Georgia Muslim Voter Project does some magnificent work with CARE, specifically CARE Georgia. We also do some great work with ISPU and we've taken a survey. So if I can just outline some things that Muslims in America have said are important to them. And this I focus on the word that Dr. Asfa just shared in terms of good work, maslaha amma, if that is correct. Alhamdulillah. So what is important to Muslims in America? First, we are very, very concerned about the Muslim ban, which is also the African ban. We say the Muslim ban a lot, but it's the Muslim ban and the African ban. What else are we very concerned about? Racial discrimination, social justice, right? And religious repression. What are the issues that we're also concerned about? And these are via polls, right? So this is not speaking about Georgia specific and I'll get to that. This is talking about Muslims, Americans who have been polled across the United States. We're also very, very concerned about police accountability, police reform. And these are some of some historical conversations that are coming out. And we also want health care for all. Going a little deeper, what does that look like? Civic engagement versus civic participation. If I go out and vote, which I already have, alhamdulillah, but if all of us go out and vote tomorrow, we are civically participating in an act, right? Civic engagement goes a little further. Civic engagement is more consistency. Right? Civic engagement is linked to, in some issues, pharmacy policy issues. Civic engagement is linked to measurable outcome based on this engagement. Many people in the Muslim community are participatory in a civic process, but we need to heighten our level of civic engagement. We're consistently talking about this major, major race, right, for president. Everybody's looking at what are the swing states, how the swing states go, and, and just to let you know that Muslims can have a major impact in how these votes go if we get out and we vote. 78% of us said that we're a lot more motivated to go out and vote for this election, which has increased from the presidential election in 2016, which was only 60%, now we're at 78%. So we're making major strides. So we're voting for the president, but no, you're also voting for Senator. You're also voting for the House of Representatives. So going back to the hadith that I read, in order for us to have an impact on our current reality, we must be engaged in the process of creating a reality that protects us and our rights. What does that mean? We have to vote. We have to vote for those who will make laws for or against us and know the positioning and the stance of the candidates. CARE has released a magnificent guide it's called the voter guide so that you can look up. It's actually in one packet. It has all of the bills and legislation that have an impact on Muslims and where your state legislature stands on those issues. Please download it. Please have a copy of it. Please show it to your children because we're about raising the next generation of those who engage in the process of maslaha amma and do the good works for their community and their society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also al-adl, right? And al-adl means the just or the adjuster. As Muslims, we should love and be against injustice. 
looking historically at the injustices in this country, right? And Muslims have taken a stand and Muslims want a president who are, is very sensitive against the injustices going on. In our reality, we have to go back to the 14th and the 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment gives us the right of citizenship. The 15th Amendment gave us the right to vote. Did it really? I call it the if, the and, or the but syndrome, right? So we had the poll tax, the literacy test, and the grandfather clause. And even though the 15th Amendment gave individuals the right to vote, the if, the and, and the but changed the situation so that it was almost impossible, if not extremely difficult, to exercise that right. And it was predominantly for those who had been enslaved Africans in this country, but not all, right? And people were killed for the right to vote. And excuse the passion, but I'm speaking from a historical legacy. My mom was present at the March on Washington in 1963. So I was going through some historical archives that said, no dough for Jim Crow, right? professional language, let's not use our tax dollars to support things that will suppress, repress, and oppress us. So moving forward, Georgia, 2018. So we don't call it voter oppression, because I don't think anybody died, right, on the lines, but it killed us on the inside to have to go to a machine that was broken to have to stand on stadium lines because the machines were broken, to have to go to polling centers that had changed and people had been going there their entire lives all to figure out, no, you don't vote here. To go to a polling center whose hours were supposed to be from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. to say we closed two hours ago, to say that your signature doesn't match, right? So we move from voter oppression to voter suppression right? The trajectory in time has changed, but some of the strategies are the same. But what are we doing as Muslims to engage in the work of changing the narrative for ourselves? Are we simply hating it in our heart, going home over dinner, having conversations? Or are we being active and engaged in process of changing the narrative? When I went to vote, I took my 11-year-old daughter with me to inspire her as I had been inspired. And she's very bright, mashallah. So she's asking me while I'm really trying to vote and leave because I have my mask on, why are you voting that way? Do you know who you're really voting for? What are the positions that they stand on? When I got to the amendments, because here in Georgia, we also had to vote on amendments. She says, wait a minute, I'm still reading that. I'm like, my dear, this is not for you. This is not for me. This is for me. But the point is taking her with me to engage and just observing my process will very much so give her something to look forward to. So going back to the work of the Georgia Muslim Voter Project. So one thing that we do is we engage with young people and we have a youth coordinator. And I feel that every Muslim organization that espouses and has in their mission information about voter engagement, civic engagement, getting out the vote, <clears throat> has to have a component of youth leadership and development as a part of their program because legacy begins today. So our wonderful executive director, Umir Rampani, met with some students uh, from Gwinnett County because their teacher had been harassed about having a Black Lives Matter poster in her room. He went into the school, he met with the students. One thing we have to do as adults, we can't give them, we have to help them facilitate process to activate their genius, right? And give them strategy to contest injustice whenever they see it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adl. He hates injustice and so should we. So he went into the school system. He helped the students have a positive protest and then address the community school board about the injustices going on in that school against one of their teachers who they felt as though stood up for justice. So where do we stand as Muslims? Will we just hate it in our hearts? Have conversations about it? 
or make a change based on how we want to protect our rights as citizens of this country under the laws of this country. And then to challenge the laws when they become unjust. That is extremely, extremely important. So I talked a little bit about what Muslims favor, right? So just to let you know, what are some issues that are critical and important to Muslims within the context of the United States and some of the things that we can stand up for and what we can look for? One thing that we all have to do and know this is we have to begin to look at research more and what our research is telling us about ourselves because we know how much more work we have to do based on the numbers. And sometimes numbers can be subject, subjective according to who's actually been surveyed, right? So thus far, there's a campaign in many Muslim organizations to have us increase our registration by 1 million. Georgia has now become a battleground state, which means if we get out and vote tomorrow, we will be able to leverage the way in which this vote goes. I'm not saying who I'm voting for. I'm just saying that we need to vote. We need to activate. We need to agitate. We need to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Based on some of the polls, a lot of people said that they were very motivated. I said 78% earlier, but you have 12%, right? that kind of don't know, right? They don't feel like it's gonna make any difference or any change. My point to that is this, in the Quran, it states in Surah al Najm, man only gets that which he strives for. The days are over are sitting back and being complacent. That is not going to work. Many of us come from strong lineage where it if they were complacent, we wouldn't have many of the things that we had today. We have to activate, agitate, call our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, get them out to the polls tomorrow, support those Muslim organizations that help us to defend ourselves as we contest legislation that is unfair and suppressive and oppressive and does not have Muslims at the center of equity and fairness, we have to get out, we have to get out the vote. I can't say it anymore. Excuse the passion, but I'm serious about this work. I love the fact that the uh, amount of engagement, just this conversation itself, the fact that we're having this today shows how important it is that we're not just conversing, but we're action acting to have plans for what we're going to be doing, right? This is a critical time. We're facing several pandemics. COVID-19 is not the only one. Social injustice is the other one. Voter suppression is the other one, but another one is also our own ignorance, right? Allow us to educate ourselves. Allow us to look at what the data is saying. We have power. Let us leverage our power. Allow us not to self-suppress. Allow us to empower ourselves and our families first and then our community. Muslim America, we got this, okay? Let's do it, inshallah. All right. Well, I love the passion. Uh, if I hadn't already voted, I'd be going out right now. That was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> This is beautiful. All right. So, uh, you know, I, I want to start out with uh, some questions that that, um, that were percolating in my mind as I was listening to both of you. And the first one is to you, uh, Sister Majida. Uh, you know, here we had the framing from uh, Professor Koraishi uh, Landis, who was, who was, you know, talking about how this is an Islamic duty. And you started out with that uh, reference to the Hadith of the Prophet. I remember growing up in the 70s, uh, going to our local masjid, and the, the issue of voting came up then, and many of the uh, immigrant Muslims who were newly immigrated from abroad, from Muslim-majority countries, uh, were not used to civic engagement, and their attitude towards voting was, and, and it was, there was antipathy. There was this sense that voting was, in fact, somehow 
um, immoral and uh, against the Sharia because by voting you are endorsing a system that um, you know that engages in not only injustice here in the United States, whether you know you can look at issues of uh, police brutality or racism, or some foreign policies that the uh, U.S. Uh, has implemented over over years that resulted in the loss of life. And so, you know, there was this sense of it being un-Islamic to, to even participate in voting. I, I get the sense from everything that you're saying that the, the tide has changed. And I'm curious from your perspective on the ground, are you facing any of that pushback or is it uh, more just a matter of motivating people who already understand it to be there moral and religious obligations as Muslims to be civically engaged? Shukran for that question. So to answer the first part, no, really no pushback. Um, I think based on what you said, we're just seeing the change of the tide, you know, as, as the time goes on, it's just a change of the tide and a change of a mindset. So I'm also a child of the seventies and I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. So what I witnessed and as I grew up, a lot of those individuals that were grassroots leaders then became the politicians, right? And so when they got into office, they did exactly what they said they were going to do because they had deeper ties to the community. So I was born in 1972 and that was the year Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman in the United States to run for president of the United States from Brooklyn, New York. So I think that the mindset has changed based on the level of the commitment and an important part, the accountability of those who have assumed office. The other thing that has changed is the fact that if someone is so anti you, right? So we're living in a times where there are a lot of things that are anti-Muslim, that are anti-Black, they're highly Islamic phobic, right? So it's like, again, people have it in their hearts. I just don't wanna sit back and do nothing. What can I do? And the more we speak to civic engagement, you can do something. You do vote for your senators. You do vote those. You do vote for those that sit in the House of Representatives. You can have an impact on the policies. Accountability looks like this. It looks like policy, and it looks like personnel. So not only do I want you to change policy, I want to begin to have people that kind of look like me. So since 2000, we've had at least 100 elected officials in the United States. So the fact that you see yourself in government also, I think over the years, again, is shifting the trajectory, the mindset, and people are beginning to see impact for the intersectionality of being Muslim in America and in politics. All right, we heard a we heard a, uh, an alarm. That was not mine telling you that your time is up. That was uh, my phone ringing. Sorry. All right, that's okay. So, um, you know, I want to, uh, to to switch back from the 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 the, the practice to the theory uh, on this one and pivot to you, Asifa. Um, You know, we have a question from Sarah Dean, which I think is very pertinent. You know, ISPU I think did a, a recent survey, the the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding of American Muslims during this voting cycle. And uh, they found that Muslims were split between Dem the, Dem the Democratic Party and the president and the Republican Party for the presidential race. I think the numbers were something like 65 Democratic, 35 Republican. Uh, and so Sarah Dean, Dr. Sarah Dean uh, uh, posted a question about how it is that we as Muslims who are looking out for the public good can have a coherent conversation to discern from that moral framework, what in fact is the moral good and the public good? Um, I think it's normal that there is almost an even split on policy questions. I think it's abnormal and maybe an indicator of a really, really, really strange time that you see now, I think this year, much, much more numbers for a particular party than the other. And I think that's just the indicator of right now. In more normal times, I think that policy questions are easily debatable. As we say in the law school, reasonable minds can differ on lots of things. You know, what, what should be the tax code? What should be 
the allocation of funds for health and education and um, you know other services that the state is providing. There's reasonable debate about those things and Muslims are humans and we're gonna reasonably debate about those things. And that's exactly a reflection of the fact that the siyasa realm, the state realm is all about maslaha. And it's, that's an empirical question as to what's in the public good. We There isn't an Islam, that's why I said that what how far parts of sun should be in your house are not a Quranic question. It's a it's an empirical question that you, you need science, you need technology, people experts in medicine, you need people experts in engineering, you need people experts in education. That's how you decide maslaha. That's my point is that the, all of our social conversation around what should we do in our role as voters and our role as public servants should be about those policy questions. And of course, we're going to disagree. These are questions that are policy questions that everybody disagrees. I think you found the same split among any religious group in the United States. It's only when things get really skewed to one direction that a particular group feels under threat from a particular party that you see that switch to one side that represents like the protection of that party. But when things are not directed at you in an attack mode, if we're just dealing with policy, of course, we're going to disagree. So the answers are not going to come from scriptural interpretation. That's exactly my point of my two pictures screen. The answers on public policy, the answers on maslaha are going to just come from us talking to each other and learning and studying and getting experts to tell us what is the environmental threat right now? You know, you guys, most of you are in California, like the question of fires is a really big thing on people's minds. And so what do we do to protect ourselves from that environmental threat? That's not a Quranic question. That's not a, it's not, a, it's not in the Hadith. How do you deal with the fires in California? It's an empirical question that we need to, lock, to, to talk to those Musla experts about. Very good. You know, it's one o'clock now. And just to give everyone a sense of anticipation, um, we plan to wrap up by 1.30. So we still have another 30 minutes for uh, question and answers, should uh, we have enough to take us there. Uh, one of the prerogatives of being the host or the co-host of this event uh, even though most people have to submit their questions by uh, text message, uh, we have a request from uh, Dr. Assad Ahmed to uh, ask a follow-up question. So the floor is yours, Dr. Assad. Thank you. First of all, let me thank both of you for these wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, this is the kind of uh, space that uh, of collaboration that I was hoping for. We have uh, from uh, Dr. Asaf Qureshi Landis a presentation of a robust uh, academic sword, and then from uh, uh, Mrs. Abdul Karim, a presentation of what Muslims face on the ground. So, and I hope going forward that similar kinds of frameworks of inquiries of middle spaces of conversation can be brought to Berkeley from other groups as well, from Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, Hindus, and so on, Hindu groups, and so on. So I, I first of all, want to congratulate both of you for the successful first event. And I, I invite others uh, from other communities also to get in touch with us for these kinds of conversations. My question is for a follow-up for Dr. Qureshi Landis. Uh, I wonder, I mean, I, I really like your framework, but I want, my job is to complicate things. This is what, what you do. <laughs> so um, in a pluralistic society, right, where you have Muslims, Christians, atheists, non-Muslim uh, Christians, uh, people of the Jewish faith and so on, there might be cases where SEAS or the public good may not be able to accommodate the public good as a whole and may end up conflicting with certain fiqhi or Islamic legal uh, aspects, right? So one, one example that comes to mind, which was actually a real one in the case of Pakistan when I was growing up is uh, the state had levied a particular tax for all citizens of the country, which includes not just Muslims, but also a minority of Hindus and so on. But then there was a question that Muslims of course wanted are and are obligated according to fiqh to pay, pay the zakat as an obligation. Now, this meant for Muslims that they were uh, burdened with double taxation, one determined by fiqh and one determined by siyasa. Mm -hmm. And this produced a problem. Now, I can imagine similar scenarios of all sorts where there would be potentially a clash between the idea of a broad public good in civil society and something else that may be very similar. Now, how would one navigate this kind of a scenario and produce Muslim civic engagement in a democratic institution with your vision and your theory of uh, Sharia? So um, the question of what happened in Pakistan, I don't know all the details, but what, what it sounds like to me is a, a typical phenomenon um, of how much of, fit, uh, of today, which is a postmodern, post-colonial nation state paradigm, how much of FIC is supposed to be enacted and administered by the state? 
And part of the problem I have seen when I look at this is that we have started to think in that nation state paradigm where everything is done by the state. So we tend to like put all the fixed stuff into state legislation and then the state is responsible for it. That's not historically always how it was. There were some things that the state was responsible for administering and Zakat actually was one of the things historically that the state often did collect and distribute Zakat. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that. I mean, my I have Zakat obligations even though the American government has nothing to do with how I pay my Zakat. The obligation still exists as fixed. The question is, when should the state be involved is again a question of public good. Is it better? Is it helpful to have the state involved in this? And if it is, then we would do it, right? And if it's not, then we wouldn't. And so I think what should have happened in Pakistan is a conversation about what are all the things that are happening to the public? And so if you're going to have the state involved in this particular fake thing, what is the impact on the Muslims in that society? And is it a double tax? And is that fair? And is that in the public good? And then you can have a conversation about that. That's not a question about what is the proper zakat. It's just a question of how much do we want the state involved with this? And this is, I thought you were going to ask me a question that's uh, to move it into the American context a little bit. I typically get a question and it sort of looked like I was getting a little bit in the in private chats too is, well, what about the FIC rules that, that I follow that I think are in the public good? Shouldn't I then be borrowing from the FIC collection and then legislating that in my role as part of the state, right? My, my role, role as a voter, a role as a congressperson. Um, and, and isn't that then, if, if it's Islamic, isn't it in the public good? Like, isn't this a circular argument? Like, oh, it's it's the, the Fuqaha have said that this, I should do this. And so therefore I should I should try to make it the public good. And, and my answer to that typically is, yeah, but you're missing the point of the two different types of law. Again, that conceptual difference is really, really hard for us to get our head around because we're so used to thinking about things in the context of a modern society where the state is doing everything. And so here's my answer to if there is a FIC rule that you like, that you think is in the public good, my argument is, okay, but by definition, something existing in the FIC doesn't necessarily mean that it is absolutely true, correct understanding of Sharia with God. You can't say that a FIC rule is correct because the Fuqaha themselves never said that. That's why we have all these different schools of thought is that they all admitted we're fallible and it's possible we're wrong. And so that's why you basically have choice amongst all the different schools. So it cannot be that just because something exists in the fic that it naturally is correct for everybody. For example, if I'm a Hanafi and I follow the Hanafi rules of divorce, then how can, what about the Maliki rules of divorce that are fundamentally different from that? Is the state can adopt one or the other? Well, if it does, it can't adopt it only on the basis that is the correct understanding of Sharia because we can't say that. We don't know which is the correct understanding of Sharia. So the only basis by which the state can actually do use its police power to force people to follow something, use its enforcement power, I argue, and I think is accurately reflective of history, is if something is in the public good. So we're right back to the same question, like whatever FIC rules you like, okay, fine, great. But if you want them to be enforced on everyone, then you have to make that second step and show everybody, or at least whoever's in power to make the law, if it's the king, you just tell the king. In our society, it's a democratic process of collecting enough of the majority to agree with you that this is in the public good. So for example, I get this, what about RIBA? What about the rules of interest? Aren't those in the public good? And I think, okay, sure. If you can make an argument that this inspiration that you got out of FIC actually would help our economy. It actually would change the wealth gap. It would get people out of debt quicker. It would change the nature of inflation. If you can convince the, uh, the public of that for reasons of the public good, then I have no problem being inspired by FIC ideas that are in the space of FIC, which are really written just for personal Muslims behavior. But if you magnified it to the, to the macro at the societal level, and it would really help all of society, then it shouldn't be that hard to convince everybody to enact it as, as public law. Because if it's really good for society, then just make the case. But you have to get your economists in there, your sociologists in there, everybody out there to really convince the mechanism by which we make public law that it actually is in the public good. So historically, if you look at our history, it is not the case that every FIC rule of Muslims was imposed on everybody in the society. Christians could drink in Muslim majority countries, right? So it can't be just a copy paste from FIC over to Siasa. It's much more complicated. It's much more nuanced. And it's honestly much more fun because everybody can be a part of that conversation. We all can study the empirical data of such and such impact on society economically or whatever else. And so that everyone can be a part of. And so it's just a matter of us engaging the public with new creative ideas that are coming from our Islamic values and Islamic past. And it could even be from FIC rules about Muslims, but don't assume just because it's a FIC rule that it not necessarily has to be legislated as state law. That I think is the mistake that Muslim majority countries are making right now.
No, you're muted. I had one more, thank you. I had one more uh, follow-up. This is for both of you actually. And I wanna start with you Asva and then switch to Majida, but it's the same question really. You know, I've seen incidents um, of Muslim candidates uh, for different levels of, of, of office. And some of them are from, you know, different sectarian groups. Um, and sometimes there's tensions that bleed over into the United States from conflicts abroad and, and manifest themselves through um, posturing here in, in rhetoric in the public space. So I've seen, for example, a, a candidate um, where on policy, there is much alignment with the majority of the issues that Muslims um, have indicated that are, that, that are meaningful to them. But there is this debate as to whether or not to be supportive of a particular candidate because they come from a different sectarian background. How would you uh, advise uh, Muslims who are civically engaged to think about those kinds of, uh, of challenges. And, uh, and then for Majida, um, I, I'm curious to see if there was ever any issue of sectarianism um, and I identity for uh, Muslims who have, who've run for office in Georgia. We'll start with you, Asifa. I'm, I'm not sure, can you give an example? Do you mean uh, a Sunni doesn't want to vote for a Shia? And, or? and Ahmadi is the example that I was thinking about in, um, in the East Coast. Okay. But, you know, I, it, this is not a particular, it's not really about the particular You're not, you're not trying to throw thing. anybody under the bus. You just want to know. Right. This is really just a, a, a question about how, how to think about, you know, this idea of personal, you know, yeah. one, of the, one of the questions that was asked uh, referenced a Muslim candidate who described God in a way that was, you know, uh, potentially, um, you know, problematic theologically. Yeah. Uh, Talking well, about the, is, you know, the gender of God, for example, sure. does yeah. this affect how we vote for that person, or should it just be about the I, policy? In, yeah. in my opinion, I am, don't make him your mufti. Fine, you disagree on fic, that's great. But if you want him to speak on your behalf for policy issues that you care about, if that uh, potential elected official is going to make your community safer and give make education more accessible and give you better health care and help you respond to COVID or whatever it is, if those are the policy issues that he stands for and you agree with those, then that's the Maslaha question you should be voting for. Again, separate the two types of law. Don't You don't need to agree theologically with anybody that's doing a job for you that's different from their theological role. So I don't, I don't judge my doctors based on if I agree theologically with them, I'm hiring them to do a medical job. And so that we should have the same attitude about all our elected officials. We're hiring them, we're voting for them to do a maslaha job. How we may not agree on them. Maybe they're for things that I completely disagree with and then I wouldn't vote for them, but not because I disagree theologically with them. I would not vote for them because their policy positions I think are harmful or not beneficial as much as another candidate. Very good, uh, Majida. Yeah, so, so my mom taught me a long time ago, take the best and leave the rest, right? So if their positioning and their stance overwhelmingly is good, based on what they say they're going to do for the population that they serve, then make Istakara on it, <laughs> okay? You know, voting and positioning is a very, very personal matter. But if we're talking about the collective that's a personal issue. You don't have to vote again. You can have a conversation with the person, but if, if the majority of what they're doing is for the good, the collective good, receive and accept. Um, you know, there's there's another question uh, related to the, the psychology and the emotion of the American Muslim community um, in general, uh, the Black American Muslim community in particular, you know, there's this idea of voter intimidation or people feeling marginalized. What, what's your sense of the, you know, even though you said that the, that the, the numbers are up to 78% uh, who, who are encouraged, uh, who feel encouraged to vote, what would you, how would you describe the sentiment that you're feeling there on the ground when engaging with the uh, American Muslim community in general? Right. So again, as we look at the data in terms of voter suppression, in terms of votes that are being thrown out because of signatories, the hardest hit are Black Muslims, right? And those from immigrant communities. And so again, 
I, th I didn't think I mentioned it here, but the, again, the voter, the Georgia Muslim Voter Project in 2018, during the governorial campaign, sued the Secretary of State at the time for voter fraud. How in the world can no one see someone running for governor and being the Secretary of State as a conflict of interest. As a candidate running against an opponent, at that time it was Stacey Abrams, who lost, but people lost a lot of votes at the same time as well. So I think we've seen that um, in general, historically, and yes, we still see that. I think that African-Americans have been impacted by that. African-American Muslims have been impacted by that because if you canvas Georgia, a lot of the disconnects in terms of the equipment were happening in predominantly African-American districts and communities. However, the Muslims were hit by that as well. I, I like, can I add to that? Yes, please. This isn't directly answering your question, but it is a little bit of, uh, it's been on my radar for a while. And that is that there is a, has been, and I hope it's changing now, a different prioritization of issues by immigrant Muslims and children of immigrant Muslims than the African-American Muslim population. And so in that 70s time period that you were describing jihad and, and, and people wondering if it's okay to vote, you, you might've got some immigrant Muslims to think about it if you thought about foreign policy. Right, so things that impact our American government's policy towards Pakistan or Egypt or any of the countries that some of these immigrants came from or feel very close to. But issues of domestic justice were secondary to immigrant Muslim agenda. And I hope that that's changing. I mean, I personally noticed a very strong shift in awareness of surveillance um, by the immigrant population after 9-11, surprise, surprise, they're now the they're the targets of surveillance in a way that they really hadn't been. And there's all oh, this up in arms about in Muslim community, immigrant Muslim communities, about, oh my God, we gotta do something about surveillance. And I'm sitting there going, uh, have you talked to Masjid Muhammad over there? <laughs> because they've been dealing with this for decades, centuries, basically. So I think we really need to take stock and say, when we're talking about the collective, we, and I come from child of immigrant and a, and a white convert, so I come from that community ge genetically and I could see the shift. And I think that we need to, speaking with the immigrant community now, really seriously focus on the domestic justice issues. This is our backyard. This is not just affecting you now because now it's changing, but these are our Muslim brothers and sisters who've been dealing with domestic issues in a way that we have been blind to for so long. If we put these two together, then you can have that million vote thing that Sister Majida was talking about. If we divorce our focus to immigrant issues and black Muslim issues, you're gonna not be able to have the kind of impact that I think we could have. They're both important. But when you talk about what's happening to us right now, these are the things that are happening domestically. And if we can stand for justice domestically, not only does it help our own personal experience and healing the wound and the rift between our immigrant and African-American population, but also it might actually change the way the general American public looks at us, that we actually care about education and safety and water and environment and healthcare in our own country. We don't just care about foreign issues. We care about American issues. And if we really make that stand, I think it can change a lot of the landscape going forward. That's just can, my soapbox. Can I just add something to what Dr. Asbasari, I see you looking at me, uh, said, you know, we are what Ummah, right? And one thing about us is we're not a monolith. We are as diverse as the United States of America. And again, if we look at history and we look at trends and we look at patterns, right? So historically, before 2001, immigrant Muslims were predominantly Republican, right? As all of these things began to happen in terms of surveillance, Muslim ban, Islamophobia, right? We see some party shifting going on. Why? Because the treatment and the injustice against a populace of the Muslim community shifted. Now, while you still have a portion of the immigrant community that is Republican and those numbers have gone up, but in small numbers, right? You'll find that 
parties have shifted based on what they didn't experience perhaps as much with a very conscious and purposeful and excuse the term, but I will say onslaught in a way of Muslims in the United States based on some policies that were anti-Muslim. So parties shifted, but the African-American community for the most part, those that were voting have historically, not unless we're talking about the 1800s, but I'm talking about after that, were Democrat. Also, one last thing, sorry, Jad. It's not just national. A lot of this stuff, the surveillance and stuff is local police departments. So pay attention to down ballot. All right. Um, I, I, there are a number of questions I want to get to um, from the, the list, but I, I wanted to, since we have uh, uh, Dr. Assad Ahmed here as well, uh, have him complicate things a little bit with some uh, challenging questions. So uh, Dr. Assad. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would ha be happy to complicate things, but if there are other questions, because I can switch to informality for a moment, Asifa and our friends, <laughs> so I can talk to her anytime. Um, uh, but it, it, it's up to you. How do you want to moderate? I, I will keep going, um, but I can do this over the phone or hang out with her over lunch. Uh, yeah. well, 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 I'll get to uh, some of the questions, but uh, but do have one formulated because I want I want you to end with something challenging because there there has been great alignment so far and complementarity to uh, the, the the their two perspectives. But you know, as they're both saying, you know, the Muslim community is not a monolith. So you know, how 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 um, can they both be challenged in in what it is that they're putting forward? Um, the uh, you know one of the challenges is regarding Islamic law, and this is the Professor John Barton um, you know had asked this question. They said, well, you know, isn't part of the challenge uh, in perception of Islamic law having to do with the codification of law or the closing the closing of the door, so supposedly of of Ijtihad uh, some hundreds of years ago, or you know just the rigidity of things and its uh, perceived inapplicability by Muslims, uh, as well as the way it's portrayed um, in, in the public imagination. What, you know, what, could, what, could you address the, the reality of that uh, or the concern that, that some Muslims express about Sharia? Even though you described Sharia as fun, uh, let's, see, let's see your response to this one. I said, I said arguing over Muslim is fun. Um, uh, I mean, yes, that's true. There's a large, population of Muslims who think that the the rules that are established in the fiqh and the collections of doctrine for Muslims are, are antiquated and outdated and got frozen and unfortunately didn't keep up with the times and so what's the consequence of thinking that well one is um, we need to do new which you have we need to do new reform and we need to go into much more nuanced detail and that's that one approach that I described is one of the approaches to responding to what should we do today is new which you had um, whether or not that should be enacted as state law is another question. Some people think it should be. This you see much more in Muslim majority countries than in a non-Muslim country. Um, but definitely, uh, it, it's one of the ways to go to kind of address the problem of the freezing of the doors, kind of the closing of the doors. But another approach is, and therefore, it's it's out. It's oh, it's, it doesn't matter anymore. And so all the law should be is just what the state law is. And we should just focus on that and then forget about all this fixed stuff. And if you want to keep it in your private life or your religious rituals, then you can do that. Um, and I think I was trying to make the argument that I don't really care <laughs> which one of those you, you take. I'm really, for this topic, I am interested in reconfiguring how we think about the role of our role in the state um, responsibility of making law or contributing to law here and the confusion that's happened because we've associated Sharia with fiqh and vice versa and there's no daylight between those we use those interchangeably and we have no sense that there's another role for the state other than either just pouring all the fiqh into the state law or taking it all out that seems to be the the breadth of thought that people Muslims have on this topic and I'm trying to say that actually that's not historically how power and authority was delegated and allocated in Muslim, pre-modern Muslim societies. I'm not saying go backwards and recreate those Muslim societies. I'm taking the core concept that there is a distinction between types of law that are personal to you as how you live your life as a Muslim and that are the, what the state is doing for the collective. There's a conceptually different types of law 
And if we focus on that, then it answers a lot of the questions that we've gotten all muddled with in today when we think about things all at once. Um, and so that that so what, what one feels about the doors of Ishtihad had a closing or not to me that's a fic question and so you can decide that on your own about what fic rules you want to follow in your life or not but the role of the state is a very different job. Well, uh, in a follow up to that, I, I know in your course that you teach uh, at Bayan uh, Islamic Graduate School on uh, Islamic jurisprudence, you 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 go into some greater depth about why Sharia has such a bad image in the public imagination here in the United States. And as you advocate for uh, reclaiming that, uh, the, 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 the idea and definition of Sharia to be one that's more sophisticated, nuanced, and reflects these values of the common good as it's expressed in a public forum, what would you say is behind that image? And what is the image of Sharia as you have come to understand it in your oh, research? What's the image here in the United States? Yes. Google the word Sharia. <laughs> it's not good. It's it's images of blood and people screaming and beheading. I mean, it's not good. And and that's why I ended my presentation with we need to reclaim that word, right? It's I'm not willing to let it go the way of your name, jihad, right? The word jihad has become a negative word and 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 well, in Arabic and Islamic conversation, jihad is a beautiful word, right? But we have gotten into the situation where we're afraid of using that word, don't name your kid jihad, right? And so now we're doing the same thing about Sharia. We're saying, oh, religious values, morality, Islam, right? And we're afraid of saying the word Sharia. And I, I'm not willing to let that go yet. I, I Maybe I'll be forced into it someday. But I look at Sharia and I see it so much more nuanced and I see it doing so much more justice in society that if we just let the terrorists and the uh, authoritarians claim that word, then we lose so much depth and strength and insight. Um, and it disassociates the Muslim community from our own terms. And that's not fair. I don't think we should let them set the agenda for us. And it's, it's, it's purely because of the news cycle, media, movies, and what kind of things of horrific actions that people are claiming they're doing for in the name of Sharia that are making the news. And that becomes the top conversational topic and take any stereotype anywhere, right? The image of the black man also is just created by all of these images of every time you see a black man in the news, it's having to do with some crime or something like that. And so it's all, a, it's a reflection of the public Im imagery that's in the public realm. And now without, with Facebook and we're all in these little bubbles, you just hear the same thing recycled. It's not even all media all the time. It's just your own internal bubble. So, you know, most Americans don't know it, don't know a Muslim or don't know that they know a Muslim. And so there's no way to counteract that other than the onslaught of what they're seeing in the media. Um, and so that's why I say, you know, if you're a Muslim public official, you should say, yeah, sure, I do Sharia. I do the public good. That's what Sharia says for a, a, an elected official. You know, that may, you may lose the election, but I hope someday we get there. That's all I'm saying. Very good. You make a strong case, Asifa. You know, uh, Maj Sister Majida, um, I, I want you to also speak to this issue as you see it uh, playing out in the public imagination and also you know, as we're coming up on the, on the end of our conversation here, um, this is no coincidence that tomorrow is, uh, you know, is election day for the presidential race, but for so many other down ballot uh, races as well. Uh, so I was wondering if you could speak to the issue of uh, Islamophobia as a wedge issue, racism as a wedge issue, and the impact it's having. Uh, and then, you know, what would be your, your sort of closing appeal or message to people to, to become civically engaged uh, on this uh, 2nd of November, the day before the election. So you've just said a lot, right? And so first of all, we have to be educators of our community and we have to educate others. Many times, some Americans do not know Muslims, right? So this word with Sharia and Jihad, don't be a Google shake, that's the first thing. Right? I had to even teach my children that when my daughter began to look, did you know that? Are you kidding me? So we have to begin to educate those who are around us about the words that they look at, think define us, but really don't at all, right? So we have to step into the role of educating. We have to educate ourselves. We have to educate ourselves in terms of the power and the importance of voice. Unfortunately, George Floyd had a knee on his neck that was 
imposed upon him. Let us not put our own knees on our own necks, right? If we have the power to get out there and to vote and we are abled and of sound mind, get out there and vote. Don't be complacent. Let's not just hate it in our hearts. Let's be purposeful and intentional. Get to those polls. Tell everyone around us that it is imperative to make change. We are not a complacent people. We're not a complacent umma. We are not a monolith and that is okay. But what will bring us together in unison is the importance of protecting who we are under the Constitution of the United States, taking the 14th Amendment to heart and doing what we need to do to exercise our 15th Amendment right as Muslim Americans. Go vote. It's beautiful. And it takes us right to 130. Uh, you know, you didn't know you were going to get some preaching here today, uh, some civil preaching, civic preaching. Um, the, uh, you know, in conclusion, I wanted to, to thank both of our speakers. Uh, I want to express my deep gratitude to our, our partner and co-host UC Berkeley Center for Middle Eastern Studies uh, and uh, the new chair of, of that center, uh, Dr. Asad Ahmed, who is a, a good friend. He also, uh, for full disclosure, he teaches on occasion as, as a visiting faculty uh, member at Bayan. Asifa, by the way, also is connected to Bayan. She, for many years, has not only taught at Bayan, but been the chair of the academic committee. Uh, and now she is the current chair of the board of Bayan. Um, and as part of this engagement with UC Berkeley and Bayan, uh, we are going to be rolling out a monthly lecture series. And this is the inaugural event. Uh, and we're already uh, looking forward to our next event, which will be in early December, I believe it's December uh, 7th. Uh, and we have here uh, Munir Sheikh, who's uh, the Vice President of Bayan, putting up the, the registration link is already there. And the there's gonna be a number of speakers, but the one that we've confirmed so far is none other than Dr. Asad Ahmed. The title of the talk is Reason and Revelation in Islam, Category Mistakes and Their Impact on Current Muslim Self-Perceptions. You can register at the same link that you registered at for this one, same time, uh, noon Pacific. And uh, we're really looking forward to uh, a series on contemporary issues in American Islam uh, as one of the ways that we'll be engaging with one another as institutions. But we have a number of other uh, conferences and symposia and fellowships amongst the graduate students and uh, summer institutes, so many other things that we have planned. Stay tuned and thank you all very much for your participation. Asad, it looks like you're gonna have to have that complicating conversation with Asifa uh, virtually over a cup of coffee. Uh, thank you all so much and have a beautiful uh, afternoon or evening wherever you are in the world. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Good vote. Assalamu alaikum. Vote.